This is the TED Health Podcast. I'm Dr. Shoshana Ungerleiter. On today's show, we go on a wild food scavenge with outdoor educator and proud vegan, Alexis Nicole Nelson. She tells us why those weeds growing out of the sidewalk might be healthier than some vegetables you can get at the grocery store. She also shares her secrets for getting others to try new foods. And then I'll speak with entomologist and educator, Dr. Samuel Ramsey, about another important player in human health, the honeybee. If a vegan falls in the forest (laughs) and no one's there to hear them say, I'm vegan! (laughs) Are they even really vegan? I like to preface conversations about my dietary habits with jokes, because brains love the ha-has, and because sometimes you say the word vegan, and people get a little afraid. <laughs> They, their mind immediately conjures this non-existent super-vegan who's an amalgam of every annoying thing they've ever heard a vegan say. (laughs) And at that point, they're checked out. (laughs) Now, if you've managed to somehow avoid the zeitgeist for the last 15 or 20 years, one, tell me how. (laughs) Two, I will tell you what vegan means, because I'm sure you're dying to know. So vegan is both a diet completely free of animal products and a person who follows that diet, often used interchangeably with plant-based, but like not necessarily done to decrease animal suffering per se, but maybe to help one's health. But that is not the argument we came to have today. No siree, Bob. (laughs) Now, I... I'm an outdoor educator. I am a wild food forager. I am a reluctant social media star. (laughs) And yes, I am a vegan. Thank you. (laughs) That's not the reaction I usually get. At the age of five, upon realizing that the cows in the field and the cows on my dad's grill were the same cows, I asked my parents if I could go vegetarian, to which they said, sure, but let's wait until you're done growing first. So sure that I would change my mind over the next five to nine years. Well, shortly after my 12th birthday, I took the plunge and I gave up meat completely. It took another 12 years for me to give up eggs and dairy, and now, between the veganism and the foraging, I have one of the more eclectic pantries in the world. (laughs) Now, foraging is the art slash science of identifying, collecting, and eating wild food. So if anyone's ever convinced you to try dandelions or wood sorrel, congratulations, you're a forager too. When my mom told me that there was a bunch of free food hanging out in lawns and sidewalks, (laughs) my mind was blown. All of these free fruits, veggies, and fungi that didn't require your water, didn't require your time, and often were healthier than their counterparts in the grocery store. Cute little fun fact just between us. We did this thing over the last hundred years where we bred foods to travel easier, be bigger, taste milder. And that often breeds out the nutrition. Let's take, for example, purslane, or verdolagas, if you're in a Spanish-speaking part of the Americas. It is a weed that grows out of sidewalk cracks in the summertime. It is chock full of omega-3s, and it ain't a fish. (laughs) 
iron. Get out of here, Popeye. <laughs> and vitamin C. Your immune system will thank you. Now, I am a forager and a vegan for much the same reason. My love of this planet and its inhabitants. But let me tell you, between those two identifiers, it's pretty hard to get people to try my food. <laughs> you tell someone something's vegan and you're already met with skepticism. Tell them it's vegan and you pulled half of it out of the ground. It's a tough sell. So today, I'm going to give all of you my tips my tricks on getting people to expand their palate and try wild vegan foods consensually. <laughs> This is not the lying liar show. It is the slightly annoying but ultimately lovable tall vegan show. <laughs> so today, we are going to be making a snack that happens to be vegan, happens to be great for the planet, happens to use one of my favorite ingredients. We are making sweet and salty kelp chips, a Korean snack known as decima tugak. Oh, thank you. A woo for the pronunciation. I was worried about it. <laughs> Now, I know all of y'all's kids are obsessed with those nori seaweed snacks. So why not kick it up a notch with a locally foraged ingredient, bull kelp? Now, I'm going to give you my first tip. When introducing a dish to skeptical mouths, it is best to use a dish that is not pretending to be something else. You know. <laughs> That way they have no prior associations, no memories to be comparing it to of their mother's version of it. Maybe they have no opinions about it at all. Now, seaweed and sea vegetables in general are a very exciting food space. They don't require fresh water. They don't require fertilizer. They don't even require land. <laughs> They're just hanging out in the salty seas, creating ecosystems, creating oxygen for all of us to breathe, and creating these amino acid-rich snacks. In this day and age, seaweed is truly future-minded food. They're an option I wish more people would reach for as runoff, water access, labor issues, and monoculturing plague a lot of modern agriculture here in North America. Yeah. Also, they taste real good! Uh, those amino acids do a lot more than adding umami to your dishes. Bull kelp, on average, packs 15.3% protein by weight. That is for everyone who asks where vegans get their protein from. We're fine. <laughs> Now, as I said before, this dish is nothing new. It's a popular bar snack in parts of Korea. And we actually have a lot of accidentally vegan recipes historically. And the reason for that is because up until recently, we did not eat this much meat. <laughs> Which is going to lead to my second tip. It's a little spicy, a little touchy, and it is this. Explain to your friends that the way that we are eating is not sustainable. <laughs> It's not. As we are constantly reaching for more land and more fresh water, we have set a precedent that our planet cannot keep up with. Tell them you are not trying to change their entire life. You just want them to be a bit more thoughtful with some of their choices, to go for those kelp chips instead of maybe pork rinds from the convenience store. I find that introducing people to wild foods in their area is an excellent way to foster their connection to their food. And it's a way that fosters that connection over shame. And it shares a snack instead of an infographic <laughs> or a shocking piece of media. Now, I'm going to be real real with all of you, because I would never not be real real with you. Some people 
are going to be salty. <laughs> and that's just, that's just the way it goes. We don't get to choose the pace at which people change, if they choose to change at all. But some people will be sweet. They will appreciate you for meeting them where they are, for sharing a snack and a smile, and maybe you extending that bit of compassion to them will make them make some big changes moving forward in their life. And who knows, maybe next time they'll be gutsy enough to try acorn cheese or something. So share that snack and make that memory. Thank you all so much for coming to my talk. Happy snacking. Don't die. Hi, TED Health listeners. Dr. Shoshana again. Alexis was right about our current food model not being sustainable. But it even extends beyond the choices we make at the grocery store or the dinner table. You've probably heard that the honeybee and native bee health is declining worldwide. According to preliminary results from the Bee Informed Partnership, last year saw the highest annual loss on record for managed bee colonies in the U.S., 50.8%. These insects are critical to crop production, and a decline in their populations threatens food security all over the world. So today, I'm joined by Dr. Samuel Ramsey, an entomologist, educator, and the founder of the Ramsey Research Foundation, where his work has led to breakthrough discoveries into declining bee populations. Dr. Ramsey, welcome. I'm so glad to be here. Thanks for inviting me. So until recently, I never appreciated the connection between the health of pollinators and human health. Can you talk about this? The connection is quite substantial, but we have a tendency in our culture, uh, definitely in America, not to really pay as much attention to insects as I think that we should. Uh, about three quarters of the animals on this planet are insects. So just think about how much of the world they make up and they run our ecosystems. Other examples of pollinators include moths, butterflies, bats, some beetles. One of the most important things about our pollinators is, well, really where they get their name from, pollination. They land on a flower, they move pollen from one flower to the next, and that allows that flower to create fruit and vegetables, the things that we consume. So 87 of the 115 leading crops produced around the world depend on pollinators for their yield. That is just incredible. I did not know that. Yeah. I'd love to hear more about your story and how you got into this work. <laughs> so it's kind of an odd story because when I was a kid, I was terrified of insects. And I thought that they were just the creepiest creatures on the planet. And my parents are like, oh, no, this is developing into an irrational fear. We've got to do something about this. So they got me a library card as a seven-year-old. And I started reading about these insects on a regular basis. And by the end of that summer, I told my parents, I want to be an entomologist when I grow up. I've always wanted to use my interest in insects and symbiosis to solve real world problems. Some of them could be in health with issues like mosquitoes and dracunculus guinea worms and better understanding them and the impact that they have on human health and how we can mitigate the problems they cause. But the one that really came up when I was in graduate school, I was consistently faced with the issue that our honeybees are declining rapidly in addition to our native bees. Our native bees are showing a lot of these same stresses and problems, but we don't pay as much attention to them. And I really wanted to give them the attention that they deserve. As somebody who is really fearful of most insects myself, I think it's incredible how you really took that library card and leaned into the fear. Yeah. Dr. Sammy, there seems to be a lot of reasons honeybee populations are declining, from intensive chemical farming practices to climate change and loss of habitat. But you've done some award-winning research. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well done there in citing that there are multiple issues all impacting bee populations at the same time. That's what makes this problem a lot more complex. Most people have heard, this is really simple, the bees are having problems because of pesticides. If we get rid of those pesticides, the bees will be fine. But one of the issues that we're seeing here is that the bees have been exposed to these pesticides for decades, and for some reason they're becoming this huge issue now. 
There were these nine different pathologies. We we're trying to understand how all of them were coming about at the same time for our bees. Well, the research that I conducted as a graduate student, I was trying to understand the connection with a parasitic mite called Varroa destructor. And that name should grip you immediately because that is dramatic. But the, the really fascinating part to me was that everything written about this creature usually says this organism feeds on the bee's blood. So it seemed like a very clear-cut conclusion that was reached through experimentation and we knew this for sure. But when I looked at the organism's anatomy and especially its metabolism, it didn't make sense that it was taking in a resource that was primarily water and converting that resource very rapidly into everything that it needed for its very rapid life cycle. They're capable of producing an egg every 30 hours. You would need a huge amount of nutrition to do that, <laughs> uh, not to mention all the other problems that would come along with it. So it was clear to me that these mites have to be feeding on some element of the bee that is very nutritively dense. And so I took some glowing fluids, these are fluorescent biostains, and stained different tissues inside of the bee's body, and then exposed the parasites to it, and then looked at the fluorescence from the digestive system of the mite, and found out that they were actually feeding on the bee's liver, which was my hypothesis at the start of all of this. It seemed like the liver would be the most nutritively dense tissue they could consume. That helped us finally understand a missing link in this system. And it turns out they're not nine separate diseases. Each one is an element of one of the essential functions of the liver. And when the mites feed on the liver, they liquefy it and suck it out of the bee's body. As they're breaking down the liver, they're destroying the processes that the liver necessarily undertakes. And that makes it very difficult for the bees to continue on their life cycle. And one of these things is detoxification of pesticides. Another of them is maintaining the immune system by producing these antimicrobial peptides, which also helps us understand why viruses, fungi, and bacteria have become such a big issue for our bees. Wow. So that is incredibly complex, and that's just one, <laughs> that's just one bug and one parasite. That's really incredible. Dr. Sammy, if we lose honeybees, are there enough other types of pollinators to keep our food production going? Well, that's a yes and a no. So we can definitely keep food production going without honeybees. Honeybees are not native to the United States. They are called the European honeybee because they are from Europe. And the settlers brought them over so that they could have this incredible insect in the colonies. Well. Without them, the ecosystem is definitely capable of sustaining itself with the multiple species of native pollinators that we already have here. It's not just the 4,000 bees that are native to North America, but all the butterflies and bats and moths and everything else. But the reason why we continuously depend on honeybees is because we want to grow more food than the pollinators can typically sustain. We want those foods outside of their normal season, and we want them now, and we want them cheaply. So if we were to get rid of the honeybees, we would lose a lot of the foods that we consume on a regular basis. They would become seasonal again. We wouldn't be able to get as much of them, which means the prices for them would go up. While our native pollinators can sustain some level of them, it would be much lower than the industrial agricultural system that we currently come to depend on every time we go to the supermarket. Ah, okay. So people like you and others are starting to raise awareness about this issue. Mm -hmm. Are we seeing any improvement or are the bee population still declining? <sighs> In some years, we will see improvement. And then we'll have years like last year where we lose more than 50% of our honeybee population. And that is incredibly disheartening while you're working really hard to figure out what you can do to help the bees. Their issues are so multifaceted because while the Varroa mite is driving the bulk of the declines, there are new issues mounting every day. The northern giant hornets, formerly known as murder hornets, those were brought over to the U.S. Those are a huge issue for them. And the Washington State Department of Agriculture and the USDA have been working hard to push them back and keep them from becoming established. But if they were to become established in the U.S., that's another stress factor. There's a parasite very closely related to Varroa that's currently spreading around the world now that I'm studying in Southeast Asia. 
And that one has even more deleterious impacts than the varroa mite. We utilize lawn care insecticides that are bad for the bees. We frequently get rid of all of the flowers in an area so that we can have a pristine green lawn. And that provides no food, no nectar, no pollen to our pollinators. So they're dealing with so many things all at the same time. And it just takes one harsh winter for them to really get impacted by all of those stress factors. So how can the average person help to solve this issue? The average person can actually do a lot. Many people in the U.S. have a home or some area where they can grow flowers. There's no reason to believe that a lawn with no dandelions on it is a better lawn than a lawn that has a bunch of wildflowers growing. That's simply the marketing tactic for a number of weed killer companies that if you are doing your job well as a homeowner, you'll get rid of all the flowers growing on your lawn because it works well for their product to be marketed. But if you were to just plant one square foot of flowers, even if you don't have a lawn, but you have a garden box that you can hang outside of your window with one square foot of flowers, you can make a huge impact on the pollinators in your area with native plants, by the way. In addition to that, how's a homeless bee? There are so many bees out here that don't have a place to lay their heads at night. They usually live in like the dried out reeds of plants, small cavities in trees. You can buy little bee hotels or you can make them yourself by just getting a chunk of wood and drilling holes into that chunk of wood. Uh, you create a little cavity that the bees can fly into and raise an entire family in a makeshift version of what they would normally nest in in the wild, and you give them the space to live their life without having to be in consistent competition with other bees. Now, that is a great way to help the native population. And you can become a beekeeper. <laughs> That's so cute. Right? Isn't it adorable? And a lot of people don't even know about these things, but there are some really fancy ones you can buy online that will dazzle your neighbors. Okay, so I feel like there are a lot more people becoming amateur beekeepers. Is this a trend that you're seeing, and is it a good thing to do? If you want to help the honeybee population, you can certainly become a beekeeper, but you have to become an informed, active, and engaged beekeeper. If you choose to just get a box of bees, put them out into your backyard, and never check on them again, unfortunately, they're going to get riddled with parasitic mites, when that colony dies, those parasitic mites are then going to be transmitted to the colonies of beekeepers who are trying to manage those populations, and it can be bad for everyone. So it's actually better if you don't become a beekeeper, if you don't have the time for it or don't want to learn about the craft. Dr. Sammy, this was such a fascinating conversation. I just <laughs> learned a ton. I just have to say, this is such important work, and I thank you so much for talking about it with me today. Aw, thank you so much. I'm really glad that I had the opportunity to proselytize for the wonderful bees. <laughs> Thanks so much for listening today. This episode was produced by Transmitter Media and fact-checked by Ted. And special thanks to Anna Phelan, Sammy Case, Grace Rubenstein, Maria Lagis, and Colin Helms. I'm Dr. Shoshana Ungerleiter. Stay well, and I'll talk to you next week.